run on cash, need some extra pocket money, or have you realized that banks are just an evil institution that deserves no quarter? The perfect time for episode 24 of Pop Art, the podcast where my guest chooses a movie from popular culture, and they'll select a film from the more art classic side of cinema with a connection to it. I am your, they're young, they're in love, and they kill people host, Howard Castor. For my listeners, please like, follow, or comment. I'm especially looking for more reviews on iTunes, and I'd love to know what you think. Today, my guest is film enthusiast Kira Comifert. Kira has chosen the modern-day Western Hell or High Water, and I chose the game-changing Warren Beatty, Faye Dunaway classic Bonnie and Clyde, both films about bank robbers. So to begin, Kira, tell us something about yourself. Guys, I'm Kira, and basically I write a little bit about film here and there. I've done a few sites over the years. Very soon I'm going to be launching my own new website, like a level up from the blog that I used to run, called Cinematique. We're pretty much a few days from launch on that. I'm quite excited to get that out into the world. And that sounds exciting. What sort of approach are you taking or what will it be about? It's pretty much anything to do with pop culture. It'll be mainly films and TVs, and that's kind of reviews, possibly a little peek at the news with some discussion around that, and then a few different think pieces, opinion pieces, pretty much any idea that comes into my head in general jibber-jabber that may be related to the subjects. More recently, obviously, with lockdowns, I think a few of us have found a bit more free time on our hands. I've gotten into video games again. That's great. That sounds very exciting. So we'll all be looking forward to that. With that, let's get to your selection, Mm -hmm. Hell or High Water. First, some information about the film. Hell or High Water was released in 2016. It was directed by David McKenzie and written by Taylor Sheridan. It stars Jeff Bridges, Chris Pine, Ben Foster, Gil Birmingham, Marin Ireland, Dale Dickey, Margaret Bowman, and Taylor Sheridan, who is also the author. The basic premise revolves around Toby Howard, a Texas man who has spent the last three months taking care of his dying mother. Now that she has passed away, he has only a limited time to raise enough money to stop the bank from cheating him out of his parents' ranch and saving it for his two children, now living with his ex-wife. He joins forces with his brother Tanner, newly released from prison, to rob just enough money from the very bank for closing on them to pay off their debt. But a wily Texas ranger is closing in on them, and their best laid plans go awry. Why did you choose this film? Well, it's a film that I really, really like. I liked it from the first time I watched it. It's an aesthetic that I really go in for. Like, I love westerns in general. It's the type of film that I was raised on because my dad loves them. John Wayne and Robert Mitchum, Clint Eastwood, they're firm fixtures on our TV. It's a modernisation on that genre. Definitely the look and the feel of it was something that drew me in. But I'd like the idea of outlaws doing something for a greater good, which is the channel that this was exploring. They're not doing things for the sake of robbing a bank. It is ultimately with a higher cause so it's a bit more of a complex moral issue I think it challenges you in a way when you're watching it because you're trying to justify what the guys are doing even though within the bounds of the law there is no way of justifying it I kind of like it for that as well certainly the morality of it and why they do it is something that will make a very interesting contrast when we talk about why Bonnie and Clyde do the same thing yeah when did you first see it I saw it around the time that it first came out here in the UK, which is back in summer of 2016, I think. I don't know what that is for you guys in the US. I think it probably opened around the same time. I saw it for the first time then, and then I've seen it a few more times since. What did you think about it upon seeing it again? I think you appreciate the subtleties of it more. The first time, Gil Birmingham's performance, it went over my head a bit in the relationship between him and Jeff Bridges because I was focusing so much on the two brothers. But then when you revisit the film, you pick up on other things that perhaps you didn't miss because it was more in the background of what you were focusing on the first time round. It definitely benefits from watching it a few times because you do pick up on a few things. And I think the foreshadowing and some of the subtleties about what coming it gives back the more that you put in if that makes sense no i think it does that is sometimes one of the benefits of seeing a movie when that you really like a second time Mm -hmm. because you do catch on to some of the foreshadowing some setups that you didn't see before and that can give it sort of a deeper emotional resonance I first saw it, as you did, when it came out. I guess I was a little reluctant at first because it starred Chris Pine. Chris Pine is incredibly handsome. Yes. (laughs) And he has a nice presence on screen, but he had never really, and still really hasn't impressed me all that much as an actor. So I wasn't necessarily eager to see a Chris Pine vehicle.
vehicle. Of course, it mm-hmm. turns out it's not really a Chris Pine vehicle, which is probably why he gives one of his better performances. He's not exactly being Chris Pine or having to carry the movie. But yeah. like you, I was also very impressed by the movie. I think I was even a little surprised by the movie that a modern day Western like this about bank robbers would be so intelligent, would be so well written. And then it's extremely well acted by all, not just the major characters, but there are some wonderful bits by supporting characters as well. Mm -hmm. It's one of those films where you have characters who may only have a few lines, but you know their whole history just by seeing them. Yes, it was ultimately very moving. And as you said, it is morally complex. Mm-hmm. It, and one of the topics I was going to bring up, and for us, we can talk about that now. How do filmmakers or writers, actually, if they're going to have people like bank robbers, if they're going to have people who do bad things, how do they make the audience get on their side? I'm massively on board with the anti-hero group of characters anyway, which I think is what these guys firmly slot into. The reason you get so behind them is because they are the closest you get to seeing normal everyday people portrayed on screen. They're not defined just as good or bad. It's not as black or white as that. They are sometimes good people doing bad things as a means to an end. Or conversely, you get bad people doing good things. It's actions that they're taking to fulfil a moral code that they've got or a set of values that they've got and really just accepting whatever else the world throws at them in order for them to maintain their own individual integrity for you watching that as a human being to see other like human beings on the screen in that kind of light validating is probably an overuse of that word but to see that it's never just as definitive as right or wrong i wrote an entire article on this a few weeks ago and i didn't butcher it anyway near as badly as what i've just done then um <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what podcasts are for, to butcher anything that you've yeah. written about. Well, I think one thing is that, yes, these aren't bad people. Yeah. They're not essentially bad people. They may be doing something bad, depending on how you feel about it. But they themselves are not really bad. Chris Pine's brother, Ben Foster, he's sort of bad, but he's not the one driving the story. He's doing it for a good cause because he's helping his brother. Of course, if he wasn't doing it for his brother, he'd probably be doing something else that would get him sent back to the prison as it is. But he does have a noble cause cause and so does yes i he's saving the ranch and it's not just that he's saving the ranch he's saving the ranch from the only truly evil and unambiguously immoral people in the movie and that are banks Mm -hmm. if you want to get sympathy for bad guys who are thieves have them go after a bank nobody cares about robbing a bank everybody in the audience they hate banks as it is they also know that banks are insured so nobody's going to lose their money anymore since the depression nobody really cares in fact everybody kind of enjoys the bank being robbed and they sort of admire people who will rob banks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also the way they're doing. They're not just robbing banks. At least that was the plan. They're only robbing the bank that is cheating them mm-hmm. and they're only going to rob it for the least amount of money they need. Yeah. So it's hard not to be on these people's side. Essentially the whole point of it is because the banks that they're robbing, they're trying to repossess their brought on. In order to stop that repossession happening, they're robbing the banks to pay them back with their own money. So there's the poetic justice in what they're doing. Right. Well, that's what their lawyer says. They ask, why are you in on this? And he says, because it's just beautiful what you're doing. Yeah. It's just the perfect response to how they cheated you. And it is interesting, the first heyday of big bank robbery movies was in the 1930s, and the banks, to a great degree, were blamed for the Depression. And now we mm-hmm. have Hell or High Water, which came at a time when the banks were in many ways responsible for the recession. Yeah. With how they set up debt and how they lo- made loans and how they called in these loans. And yeah. it was just an awful time for a large number of people. But here they're very egregious in the way they take advantage of someone dying Mm -hmm. in order to take possession of this land. What are some of your favorite scenes from the movie? I think everybody who's seen it really likes the scene in the restaurant with Jeff Bridges and Gil Birmingham's characters where the waitress comes in and she asks, what don't you want? That is a magical scene in the entire film. It's kind of away from the main themes. I think in terms of the tone of the film, it really matches the feel of what you get. That is definitely one of my favorite scenes, yes. And I think more with a focus on those two characters as well. The dialogue between those two characters is wonderful. There's a real friendship there, although neither of them would ever really admit it. It's quite fitting if you think about the generation that they're both from. Gil Birmingham probably a generation after Jeff Bridges, to be fair. Neither of them would ever admit, I don't think, how much that friendship 
it means to them and that really comes across in the interactions that they have and at the same time you have moments like that with Chris Pine and Ben Foster there is a real family bond there that they would do anything for each other and for the people that they love is what they're doing throughout the whole film taking care of those closest to them by any means there is um, a one scene between the brothers where they're just out on a field. Yeah. And they start hitting each other and wrestling each other. There's no yeah. dialogue. It's all visual. And that just sort of sums up their relationship. That was just so brilliant a way to define these two characters. You could look back on that film so many times. Every single time you watch it, you would find a different scene that really leaps out at you. The three or four times that I've seen it, there's been different moments that have grabbed me. That would probably be the same case watching it again and again after this moment too it touches on a lot of different aspects of relationships and people in general i think each time you watch it you have a slightly different response different things touch you in a way one of the things i was very impressed about it though i probably shouldn't be since taylor sheridan wrote it is how incredibly accurate a trail of texas it is i grew up in texas yeah. i didn't grow up in west texas but i grew up in corpus christi which is southeast texas but a lot of that really resonated. One of the funniest scenes for me is when Ben Foster asks his brother to get him a Dr. Pepper and his mm -hmm. brother comes back with a Mr. Pibb. Before Ben Foster says anything, I'm going, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. If you ask for a Dr. Pepper, you don't bring a guy a Mr. Pibb. You just don't do that. If you grew up in Texas, I like Dr. Pepper better than Coca-Cola. Yeah. And Mr. Pibb is just not Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Overall, it just had an incredible feel for Texas. People tend to be often very friendly or very forthcoming, very nice. Sometimes Texans are annoyingly nice. But it's sort of ironic because it also looked incredibly Texas, like the Texas I grew up in. But none of it was shot in Texas. Where was it shot? New Mexico. Texas had gotten rid of its tax incentives for filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So they went over the border to Mexico and not a single scene was shot in Texas. And they say you can tell instantly by the road signs. The road signs in New Mexico are done differently mm -hmm. than the way they're done in Texas. But it looks very Texan. The wide open spaces, the cities that seem very hot and empty at times, very small, very dusty. These huge alleyways and back roads. That added something to me because it was also to a certain degree very nostalgic as well and the cinematography is absolutely beautiful yeah it's certainly one of the highlights of the movie yeah and the way everything is framed i think it also does some interesting things with religious imagery certainly not just the texas ranger gill who mm -hmm. is catholic takes it very seriously but it opens with the two brothers driving their car through this opening where you can see across the street there are three crosses on a church mm -hmm. this refers for me to of course the crucifixion because that's what the church would have up it would be three crosses for the crucifixion but on either side of christ when he died were two thieves yes so this represents both brothers who are the two thieves mm -hmm. one of whom that day will be with christ in paradise and then one of them does die one of the first foreshadowings of what's to come i also think having the brother die also helps make in a way what chris pine's character does more forgivable because someone does pay for yeah, I think this is something that always happens when you've got those slightly off-center protagonists. There's right. always a cost somewhere. They may get away with committing the crime or whatever conventional rules it is they break. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in this instance, it was the brother. That was the cost that unfortunately mm -hmm. caught up with them. What did you think of the acting in the film? Admittedly, I'm kind of in love with all aspects of the film. Everything was just brilliant. <laughs> but if I had to be picking favorites, Ben Foster is definitely one one of the standout performances. Jeff Bridges got nominated for an Oscar. Um, well, he plays his charming racist curmudgeon which is one of his go-to signature performances. Yeah. Yes. This is around the time that I think Jeff Bridges had gone away for a little bit, or he was doing a few films that perhaps weren't being as well received. R.I.P.D. came before this, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So around this time, he started to appear in a number of quite well-talked-about films. I did this, and then I think it was the next year he did Bad Times at the El Royale. There was kind of a renaissance for Jeff Bridges. It harked back to character that people had seen him play and had loved in the past. Perhaps it marked a bit of return to form for him. Perhaps the Oscar nomination was more of a service to him. I don't know. Not that Jeff Bridges should or is a racist 
emotion but it's a role that fits him it, right. it feels right when you're watching him but the person who really is outstanding in this film and it's one of those characters who doesn't say as much he's certainly not in the limelight all the time Gil Birmingham he is one of the unsung heroes of the film with the performance that he puts in yes I love all the acting I think I agree with you Ben Foster just seems to be someone who deserves a better career than he's getting yeah I'm not quite sure why except that I guess he's just so much a supporting character and so much a character actor that it can be hard to figure out well, what do you do with him I could be wrong in saying this but I haven't really seen him in any massive films blockbusters or anything a huge part in anything that would have put him on the radar for more mainstream audiences it's always been these smaller more independent films that have come out in the more off-peak times of the year this came out at the end of the summer for us so comes out to kind of plug that gap between blockbuster season and the school holidays later on in the year right so i don't know if perhaps he just hasn't been in a film that has drawn in the numbers yet Till that happens or he ends up in one that rakes in a load of awards, I think he's going to remain very underrated, which I don't personally think is a bad thing. There have been a lot of actors over the years who haven't had all the glory that they probably should have deserved, but as such, he also possibly has a lot of stage. I know that he did a very acclaimed production of a streetcar, Gillian Anderson in London. Gil Birmingham probably falls sort of into the same category. He's a supporting actor. He's a character actor. He's generally not someone who is going to get lead roles. So I think sometimes yeah. people do get lost and we'd like to see more of them. But in these days where the studio doesn't really produce the vast majority of films, where studios don't put people under contract for years and mm -hmm. has to use them, or they just don't work but still earn a paycheck, these people can easily get lost. Yeah. I also want to give a shout out to Dale Dickey. Yes. She is the one who opens the bank, the yeah. very first one who doesn't take nothing from nobody. I would no. love to see a lot more of her. She's someone who I've noticed she's a face that pops up in a lot of things. I'm just re-watching Breaking Bad at the minute and she appeared right. in that. She I think appeared I first saw the... her in Winter's Bone. I remember her being in that. First thing I saw her in was Out of the Furnace and it was like literally a split second she was on screen for right at the start of the film. But I think she's got quite a distinctive face you see her and you're like oh i've seen her in this this and this but you don't always have the name to put to her are you a fan of taylor sheridan i don't want to make a really bold claim here but i think i have seen a lot of the recent films that he's written because when i was looking for films similar to hell or high water i noticed that most of the other films that he's written come up as suggestions to watch next so you've seen things like Sicario and Wind River. Yeah. And how did you feel about those? Again, the very harsh critic that I am. I loved both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very stingy with the golden reviews. I really like Sicario. I've seen that a lot of times. I only watched Wind River for the first time around Christmas this last year because it was on Netflix. And I'd heard good things about it. And obviously I knew who'd written it and the other projects they put out. I had high hopes for it. And I, I loved that. I watched it with my parents. They loved it as well. Obviously I've recommended it. Probably Probably written others as well. Has he hasn't written very many so far. Only about five or six. One television series. I'd have to be honest and say I'm not quite the fan you are. I think okay. Hell or High Water is his best movie. The problems I have with Sicario and Wind River are exactly the same. They have two lead characters, both mm -hmm. female, who have nothing to do in the movie. And if you took them out of the movie, the plot would work out exactly the same way it does okay. as it does then. I know when Sicario came out, a lot of people's main criticism was the performance by the lead actress mm -hmm. my response was well it's not her fault she doesn't have anything to do she has no purpose for being in the movie there's nothing really going on she has nothing to act that's interesting i always thought watching sicario that emily blunt's character acts as a bit of a moral compass she's like the true good i don't know if that makes any sense there's but, some quite shady characters and shady goings on certainly questionable methods about how the drug enforcement guys go about doing the things they do she seems to be like a constant reminder that they are straying away from what really should be happening. 
Taylor Sheridan is quite incredible at dialogue and character. Yes. And he's one of our best writers today. Well, with that, here's some more information about the movie. It cost $12 million to make, but it made $37.9 million at the box office. So it did very well. It was nominated for four Oscars, Best Picture, Best Supporting Actor, Best Original Screenplay, and Best Editing. So it did not win anything. It's the second installment of Sheridan's trilogy of modern day American frontier. Sakaro is the first and Wind River is the third. Mm -hmm. The phrase hell or high water has a double meaning. As an idiom, it means to do whatever needs to be done, no matter the circumstances. But it also refers to the hell or high water clause in a contract, usually a lease, which states that the payments must continue regardless of any difficulties the paying party may encounter. And both definitions apply to different parts of the plot in this movie. Mm -hmm. And finally, Taylor Sheridan has a cameo as the cowboy who is leading his cattle to safety from the fire. With that, let's get to my selection, and that is Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde was released in 1967. It was directed by Arthur Penn and was written by Robert Benton and David Newton, with contributions by Robert Town and Warren Beatty. It stars Warren Beatty, Faye Dunaway, Michael J. Pollard, Gene Hackman, Estelle Parsons, Stenford Pyle, Deb Taylor, Gene Wilder, Evans Evans, and Mabel Cavett as Bonnie Parker's mother. The drama covers the lives of Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker, two lovers who robbed banks during the early 1930s, joined by a mechanic they picked up along the way, and then by their brother and his wife. But the more banks they rob and the more people they kill, including a number of law authors, ensure that they can never live a normal life and that their days are numbered. So what do you think of the pairing of the two films? I thought it was bang on, to be fair. As I was watching Bonnie and Clyde, I was writing my notes down afterwards. I was drawing a lot of similarities between the two. When did you first see the film? A few days ago, okay. in preparation for this. <laughs> I get that a lot. <laughs> And what did you think of it? I really enjoyed it. I thought it was obviously Bonnie and Clyde being the real life individuals that they were. It called for an interesting female performance from somebody. And I think for the time it was made, I really liked what Faye Dunaway did with the character. She doesn't just settle for being just another female character. Mm -hmm. There is something about her. Kind of a little bit what Bonnie was getting at in the film is she didn't just want to settle for a woman's lot. She wanted something more, have what she felt she deserved. I really liked that aspect about because I thought for the 60s my knowledge isn't extensive I've seen a few films they are mainly limited to westerns as I've already confessed for that period in time I thought it was quite an interesting character to have and um, performance that went with it I thought it was probably something that stood out more from the era if that makes sense yes it does I certainly agree with Faye Dunaway and the character this is a female character that made a decision to do what she did mm -hmm. and she owned that decision she did and settle for what society wanted her to be. That has its good points and bad points, but I think that that's very, very true. I first saw it, not when it came out, I would have been just a little too young to be able to mm -hmm. get into the movie theater to see it, so I had to wait until college. And it was, in many ways, as you alluded to, quite different. In many ways, I think it is one of the most important films in American history and one of the most important films of the 1960s. It demarcated the movies that came before and the movies that came afterwards. And there were a couple of reasons for this. It started introducing new styles, new approaches to filmmaking. Some of the things it did was it introduced French New Wave into American film. It was one of the movies that started introducing existentialism, which is hard not to do if you're going to introduce the French New Wave. It also started introducing postmodernism. Some of the influences of the French New Wave is the tunnel shifts. There's a lot of humor, there's a lot of violence. The tunnel shifts are sometimes very abrupt, sometimes very quick, and that was a mark of the French New Wave. Also, the editing is much more choppy. The whole film, as beautiful as it is, it does not have the studio-controlled look mm -hmm. of films that you see before us. We start getting films that are purposely a bit more raggedy, a bit more experimental. It started introducing postmodernism before this. Gangster films like this hadn't really been made since the 1930s, unless they were sort of B-movies. And they did have a hard time getting this movie made because MGM, for example, said, well, we made these kind of movies in the 1930s. We don't really want to go back to the 1930s. Who wants to see gangster films 
it turned out that a lot of people wanted to see uh, gangster films. So basically, it posited that B-movie genres like horror and sci-fi, a lot of film noir, which were considered sub-genres, now became major genres. Everybody was doing this, not because they had to, but because they wanted to. They thought these were worthwhile genres. It also introduced existentialism, and the authors, Robert Benton and David Newton, were very influenced by French New Wave writers. And I think where existentialism comes in, the reason why they're doing this, they are not bank robbers because they necessarily need the money. They're not bank robbers because they're Robin Hood. There's some sort of moral justification where they want to get back at the bankers. They're bank robbers because they're bank robbers. This is what they are. This is what they do. If life has no meaning, if life is essentially absurd, if it makes no sense, then you have to make your own decision. You have to decide what gives your life meaning and you mm -hmm. have to stand by it. And so they just said, well, bank robbery is what gives our life meaning. We're going to stand yeah. by it. We're going to own it. We're not going to apologize for it. Yeah. So in that way, how do you think that compares to hell or high water? What was very clear when I was watching Bonnie and Clyde was very much what you said. They were proud of the fact that they were bank robbers. And there's that scene quite near to the start of the film where they pull into the fuel station and they pick up their driver. Michael J. Pollard. CW. E and they pick him up. You have Bonnie. She has the conversation with him about the car. What kind of car is this? He says, and she's like, no, 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 no. It's a stolen Ford. Kind of trying to recruit him. And they say, well, if you don't think you've got it, then the guy obviously comes on board with them and becomes their driver they were very out and proud with that they didn't shy away from it they were doing it for the reason that it gave them some meaning and some purpose and gave them a bit of a kick but with hell or high water it was very much a means to an end they were doing it because it had to be done and it was the only way they could see of doing what needed to be done but also it was a way of sticking it to the people who had landed them in that situation in the first place two birds with one stone situation in that film whereas here it was very much we're doing it because we quite enjoy doing it but when they first started going with it there was a bit of an emphasis on not hurting people unless they absolutely had to whereas in hell or high water the end game for them was the main thing you might say that now we've come full circle existentialism doesn't really affect us like it did uh, existentialism reaches a point where there's no real end game so what do you do when there's no real end game you, you have to let it go so we've moved from people who, who do it because it finds meaning to a more pragmatic in hell or high water they're doing it because they have to have this money and they're getting back at the very institution that cheated them yeah and that's why more people are these days it's no longer what is the meaning of life it's more we have to get by we have to survive what do we do to yeah. survive yeah it's also more what do we enjoy doing what helps us forget the fact that life has no meaning more than let's create meaning for our life mm -hmm. but it is interesting to note in Bonnie and Clyde though banks are the villain in both cases they sort of had to rewrite history in Bonnie and Clyde because Bonnie and Clyde really didn't rob anything okay and one reason is because, well, the banks didn't have much money. This was the Depression. Yeah. So, and what they did was rob stores and gas stations. They robbed people like you and me in real life. Mm -hmm. But they downplayed that in the movie to make it seem like all they do is rob banks. But it was one way, as we talked in Hell or High Water, how do you make people who do bad things more likable or either people you want to watch? And this is certainly one of the things. Just gloss over certain things. There are a couple of other things they do here. They have very likable actors in the role. We're in Beatty and Faye Dunaway yeah. or in many ways very glamorous. That's going to go a long way. And this was the 1960s. Vietnam was revving up. There was a lot of corruption. People were no longer enamored of institutions. Yeah. People were rebelling against everything. So here we have two people living outside of institutions rebelling against everything. But they did one more thing that is very, very interesting to make the people more acceptable. In the original script, Clyde Barrow was bisexual. Mm -hmm. He wasn't impotent. And what they would do, according to Benton and Newton, mm -hmm. Hyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker would go along and they would pick up himbos, basically. Mm -hmm. They would pick up good-looking blonde guys yeah. and have menage a trois. A lot of people deny this today. They say it's not true, but that's how the original script working. And getting producers interested, according to Vito Russo, who wrote about this in The Cellular Closet, which is a book about the history of how gay people are portrayed in films, they said, mm -hmm. you can't do this. The audience will accept a murderer and bank robber and like him and be on his side. They will not do the same for a gay person. So he cannot be gay in any way or you, you will lose the audience. Also, Vito Russo at a lecture made a very interesting comment. Once you cast Michael J. Pollard, well, that idea just went out the window because <laughs> Michael J. Pollard is not anything anywhere close to what you would call a hymn <laughs> 
Yeah. So that was the final nail in the coffin. But I do maintain that his character, as written in the film, makes no sense unless you know that originally the part was written for a good-looking blonde guy who was picked up, not because he was a mechanic, but yeah. to part of their sexual liaison. Yeah. I love Pollard in the part. I think he's a lot of fun. But what are some of your favorite scenes from the movie? I really like right at the start when the two meet for the first time. Bonnie was running circles around Clyde with what she was telling him about her ideas for the world, all of this. I liked that. I don't know an awful lot about Bonnie and Clyde. I knew of them. I had a rough idea of what they'd done. They're not, of all the infamous criminals throughout history, they're not a pair that I'm totally hot on. That specific scene at the start really introduced me to what we were going to be dealing with, at least on her part, because she really lays down the law at that point she's not just gonna roll over and take whatever anybody gives her that relates to the scene where they're taking the photo right. with I, I don't know if he was a sheriff he was a texas ranger when they're having the photo with the texas ranger and she starts getting really theatrical with that pointing the gun at him and then she kissed him i really liked what they did with the character she's probably so out there for the time that this film was made i wouldn't describe myself as a raging feminist but i liked the fact that we had this woman on screen and she was just owning everything she knew what she wanted wanted and she was going to have it. I think it's getting better now, but I certainly there are times when female characters are too apologetic for wanting the things that they want for the reasons that they want. She didn't explain herself at all. She just, this is what I want and I'm going to have it. That was very much the way she always came across. And those were two scenes that really encapsulated that for me. Certainly when it came to the portrayal of women, this was actually the beginnings, mainly in the 70s and 80s, when the portrayal of women started reaching a low point. They they were back to being prostitutes a great deal of the time, mm -hmm. having to do nudity when they didn't necessarily want to. In many ways, this was going back to the pre-code era, yeah. where women had the same complaint at that time as they were starting to have in the 70s and 80s. Why are we only being cast as prostitutes? Why do we mm -hmm. have to do all this nudity? You also have what I consider very misogynistic portrayals of women in One Flow of the Cuckoo's Nest and Network, Fatal Attraction. Yeah. You certainly have others that are not, like Aliens, yeah. Halloween, and Star Wars, a term yeah. So you do have exceptions. One of the reasons why, again, the studio was different. They didn't put people under contract. So if you have female actors under contract and if they don't work, you still have to pay them. What are you going to do? You're going to make movies that they star in. So they're going to get much better roles. And since censorship was in, you weren't going to cast them as prostitutes as much. You had to be very, very subtle or very, very careful in how you did it. It had its negative side. You started getting the femme fatales, which were the most interesting characters of the 1950s. But they were also in the studios telling women, this is what you're like if you're not going to be yeah. a wife and mother. Mm -hmm. so, but you're right. This is one of the best female parts at mm -hmm. the time. Certainly one of my favorite ones has to be the Gene Wilder, Edith Evans scene where Buddy and Clyde, they're stealing the car. Then they also take this couple along with them. And apparently Bonnie and Clyde would do that, either in stealing a car or they would just pick up somebody, have fun with them as they do in the film, and then just drop them off somewhere, often with money to get back. And it all stopped when it finds out that Gene Balder is an undertaker. Originally, that scene apparently had come much sooner, but one of the contributions that Robert Town made was he moved that scene up much farther mm -hmm. to give it much more of a foreshadowing to the ending to come. Yeah. Also, speaking of the Dimfil Pyle character, if I have this right, the character he's based on never met Bonnie and Clyde until the ambush. It's not that they didn't do that, I think, to some Texas Ranger policemen, but they didn't do it to the character in the film. And I think his state sued and they had a settlement out of court about that portrayal. I think overall it changed the way movies were made. In some ways almost didn't. It had a hard time getting financing but people believed in Warren Beatty and so they finally allowed him to do it. I think it went over budget. They also had a hard time finding a director and in fact they offered it to both Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, the two leading French filmmakers at the time of the new wave. Truffaut turned it down to do Fahrenheit 451 and Goddard wanted to do it in winter in New Jersey. And they said, no, you just can't do it. It's based on real people. It took place in Oklahoma, Texas, Missouri. Little floppy said, well, you're talking about money and I'm talking about art. And he sort of left in a huff. Mm -hmm. I think Truffaut also met Warren Beatty. And I think Truffaut said, I'll never work with this person. 
when Godard saw the film, he actually left a note to the filmmakers and said, well, when you're ready to remake it right, let me know. <laughs> it also made a success of bluegrass music, which had not been that popular before this, but Flattened Scruggs, who did Foggy Mountain Breakdown, which is one of the main pieces of music throughout film. I remember bluegrass music became a huge success again. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can't forget the cinematography by Burnett Guffey, who did win an Oscar for it. He also did the cinematography for From Here to Eternity, for which he won an Oscar, and In a Lonely mm -hmm. Place. So he was one of the major cinematographers at the time. What did you think of the look of the film? I thought sometimes what has kind of put me off watching older films is I sometimes think they look, in terms of the colours, a bit dull. Whereas the colours here, they were very bright. I like the tones that were used. Bonnie and Clyde, they were always quite warm in colour. I don't know if that was a trick to get people on. I mean, I didn't have a problem with liking them anyway. I don't know if that was perhaps to try and draw the audience in to side with them more or what. I don't know. But I liked the way that they were shown in a slightly more golden light than the others were. It seems to me that we look back on Bonnie and Clyde as, as legends in a way. And certainly the film romanticises the characters because of what you said, that they robbed the banks as opposed to normal everyday people every element of the filmmaking works in order to do that it boils down even to the cinematography you call them a colorist i don't know what the actual verb for doing it is like in terms of choosing the color palettes that go into the pictures on the screen they all combine quite well in order to achieve that end goal of making the characters likable i think like hell or high water both cinematographers and the directors through their visual style just capture the location and their periods perfectly mm -hmm. in, in the same way in binding clyde the small all towns and poor background, the city in the midst of the depression. The camera's often perfectly placed. The choppy editing, which was different at the time, works very well. It just looks beautiful. It just captures mm -hmm. this place and time. And what did you think of the acting? Just to sing our praises again, I love what Fade on the Way did. <laughs> <laughs> I just want everybody at home to know I was very much on board with that performance. What she did with the character, loved it. But I also liked what Warren Beatty did as well. I really liked Clyde. The way that he come across, especially at the start, there were a few little quirks about him later on. Certainly at the start, when he was looking at the car, was hit by this tornado that was Bonnie. The way he dealt with that, I don't know if bashful's the term, there was certainly something quite endearing about the way that he came across. A little bit later on, after they'd done a robbery that had gone slightly wrong and he gave her the option to get out then because he was known to the police and she wasn't she still had a chance if she wanted to leave this was it there's something nice about that he was trying to look after her but he wasn't trying to do it for her he was giving her the choice I, I don't know if that's entirely down to his performance but we'll give Warren the credit there <laughs> and I just think they've both produced two characters that were very easy to warm to it's interesting that in both cases both actors had difficulty later on on for, I want to say, in a way, personal reasons. Of course, Faye Dunaway finally became impossible to work with. She had emotional problems. If she wasn't on medication, she could be a nightmare to work with. Not totally her fault. She actually had really serious issues that she never could quite get a handle on until finally nobody wanted to work with her. Nobody could work with her. And she stopped getting good roles. As she was one of our best actresses of the 60s and 70s. Warren Beatty, I think, think his ego to a certain degree got in the way. Mm -hmm. He made a series of wonderful movies, but finally I think he had trouble deciding, well, what role is good enough for me and what is going to be my next role and what will, I, I won't say make me look good, but mm -hmm. I think it became more and more difficult for him to decide what role he actually wanted to do because the success of the movie and how good he was in it and how he came across became so important. He actually started making fewer and fewer movies until he stopped making movies for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's too bad because both of them had incredible talent. Whereas the supporting characters, well, Michael J. Pollard was always a sort of character actor and he stayed a character actor, but both Gene Hackman and Estelle Parsley went on to incredibly long and very impressive acting careers in both cases. Gene Hackman is a character actor who played leads and Estelle Parsons is just one of our finest character actors, both on stage yeah. and in movies. With that, here is some more information about film. It cost $2.5 to make and it made 70 
$2 million, but it almost didn't. And the reason for this is the studio didn't have a lot of faith in the film, so it gave it a very small opening and wasn't going to really expand it. In addition, the reviews were not strong. Many of the reviewers thought this was a really immoral film, the way it made light of violence, that made it made heroes of these two characters approach to the subject matter. But then two things happened. The review in Newsweek, which was first negative, but the reviewer realized that the audience seemed to really like it. So he saw it again, and this was Joe Morgan's turn, and he wrote a review in support of the film. And then Pauline Kael wrote a lengthy freelance essay in The New Yorker in praise of the film. And hers was actually the most important turning point when it came to that, when they realized there were some critics who really did like it. And if you went and saw it with an audience, the audience really seemed to like it. So they reopened it and expanded it. And with that, mm -hmm. it ultimately made 70 million. This was Gene Mulder's film, debut, and he plays the undertaker who is taken for a ride along with his girlfriend, by Bonnie and Clyde. Mabel Cavett, who played Bonnie Parker's mother, was a local teacher who they just noticed while they were filming the family reunion and then cast her. Shirley McLean was first considered for the role of Bonnie, but when Warren Beatty decided to play Clyde Barrow, well, they really couldn't go through with that since they were brother and sister. <laughs> but speaking of the critics, one of the critics who gave it a very negative review was Bosley Crowther of the New York Times. The newspaper decided that his review seemed so out of touch with the public that they fired him. And then Pauline Kell, after essay in The New Yorker, was hired at The New York Times as the new staff critic. It got Academy Award nominations for Picture, Director, Actor, Actress, Two Supporting Actors, One Supporting Actress, Original Screenplay, Cinematographer, and Costume. It won Best Supporting Actress and Cinematography. The role of Estelle Parson, the person she played, was still alive at the time that the movie was in production. She had signed off on the original screenplay, but then when she saw the movie, they had changed the character. She was really upset because they had turned this character into a horse's ass. <laughs> it lost Best Picture to In the Heat of the Night. There's a book called Pictures at and it's by Mark Harris. And he does analysis of the five pictures that were nominated that year. And this was Dr. Doolittle in The Heat of the Night, Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And he said this designated the huge shift between the old Hollywood and the new Hollywood. In The Heat of the Night was the compromise between the old and the new Hollywood. So one of nine films to get five acting nominations. With that, do you have anything else you might want to say about this movie or Hell or High Water or for both movies? I obviously, I'm obliged to say that if you haven't seen Hell or High Water, then you absolutely should. It's one of my favourites. So it'd be wrong for me to not give it that glowing endorsement. But I will also say that I really enjoyed Bonnie and Clyde as well. Not that I didn't think I would, but there are so many films in existence. I think there are definitely periods that I've neglected to explore, possibly because of my feelings towards... We come back to the point I've made about female characters. Generally, you go back in history. They're either very plain or they're insufferable. In Bonnie and Clyde, that's not the case. Certainly, if you want a good female character to watch, then obviously watch, check it out. I was surprised by how much I enjoyed watching Fade Away in that role. But also, for the time that it come out, it's one of the juiciest. My issue with watching some of the older films, because of the times that come out and people's sensitivities and also perhaps censorship in a way, I feel like things are toned down, watered down almost so that there's very little to really get your teeth sunk into. That wasn't the case with this. Like, I times watching that, we weren't far off. Some of the films were like the 70s in terms of the action and the things you get to see. It's definitely leaning into that period. It's worth watching for that. Great. Well, with that, let's start closing out. I mm -hmm. asked you to choose a film or two to go with your choice that would interest yes. our audience. I mentioned this earlier on. Out of the Furnace is a good one to watch if you like Hell or High Water. They're not hugely similar in terms of bank robberies, but in terms of like brotherly relationship and kind of doing what has to be done as opposed to what is the right thing to do. It definitely hits on those notes. And in terms of a similar aesthetic, you'd have to watch another film that's a favourite of mine, which is No Country for Old Men. It bridges the gap between the traditional westerns and this more modern western western that is hell or high water that is for so many reasons one of my all-time top three films that i've ever seen and i'll jump at any chance to recommend it 
Great. As for me, I will go with two films that are inspired by Bonnie and Clyde. They're not based on Bonnie and Clyde, but mm -hmm. they were inspired by them. First is They Live by Night, a 1948 film directed by Nicholas Ray. I believe it was his directorial debut. It stars Farley Granger and Kathy O'Donnell, about two lovers who are on the lam and their doomed relationship. Very much a very 1948 approach to the subject matter. The next one is Gun Crazy in 1950 with John Dahl and Peggy Cummins, which is very much a film noir film fatale approach to the subject matter is John Dahl. This is an innocent guy who gets picked up by Peggy Cummins, who is a sharpshooter in a circus act, and she talks him into becoming a bank robber. What is next? What should we be looking for? Obviously, the new website, Cinematique, that is at the time of recording. I'm going live in a few days' time is what I'm pushing for. Pretty much to kick things off there, I'm doing 31 days of horror throughout October. So I'm reviewing a different horror film each day, some of which I've seen before and some of which are completely new watches to me. There are recommendations from the lovely people of Twitter. Also films that I've been wanting to get around for quite a while and because it's Halloween seems like the perfect time to catch up on them. That's really the main thing to keep an eye out for from me if people want to have a read of that. I won't be focusing just on horror just for the time of year that I'm launching with. Great. As for me, I'll go over my usual listening. I'm a screenwriter and script consultant, so I have a Facebook page called Howard Kastner Script Consultation. I have a blog called Rantings and Ravings, where I talk about issues related to film and screenwriting. I've published two books of short stories on Amazon, The Starving Artist and Other Stories, and The Five Corporations and One True Religion. These are sci-fi or supernatural fantasy short stories. I have published on Amazon the second edition of my screen writing book called More Rantings and Ravings of a Screenplay Reader, and I'm an amateur photographer, and you can find that on Instagram. The previous podcast was with writer, director, actor, podcaster Donald McKinney, who after doing the premiere episode of Pop Art some time ago, returned to discuss The Goonies and the 1959 film The Bridge, two movies about teens joining up to protect their homes. The next episode will be with writer and film creator, influencer, and book reviewer Hermione Stroud, where we will discuss The Running Man and the Most Dangerous game, two movies about hunting men for sport. With that, Kira, I very much want to thank you for being a guest on my show. No problem. Thank you for having me.